Perfect. Okay. Put the face up on the top there, guy. Right like right now, if I got into the harmonica because I was in a punk band and I was the singer and the other guys in the band were starting to sing too. So I was getting benched and I didn't have an instrument and you know they didn't want me to play like guitar or piano or, or something I could really ruin the song, right? <laughs> so they got me a harmonica so I could like only mar it, right? And I went in and uh, I had this guitar teacher, I was taking a little guitar, and he was playing harmonica one day, and I said, hey, can we do that instead? And I kind of gravitated towards it. But the first thing he said to me was, you know, if you want to play this thing, you're gonna to have to listen to blues. And my heart sank, y'all, because I was a, you know, a 12-year-old kid from Maine, and I was like into the Misfits, and the Ramones, and Dead Kennedys, and Seven Seconds, and Fugazi, the Pixies, Breeders, that was my jam. And I, I didn't want to hear this old music by people that were older than me and didn't look like me. I didn't want any of that. But my mom was like, you know, look, this guy's coming. She was cool because she grew up in the 60s and she had seen like Albert King and Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf because like artists like Clapton and Janis Joplin and the Stones would get those guys to, and expose them to white people in America, right? So my mom was one of these white people that saw some of this shit, knew better than me, and said, we gotta go see Cotton, right? So we get there, and it's a bunch of drunk fishermen, right, in <laughs> Maine, watching this guy. And he's up there, and this band was Johnny B. Gaten on bass. I didn't know that at the time, but this was like James Brown style funk blues, okay? This was cotton in the early 80s. It was fire, fire. Like, it was gospel tight, gospel tight. But with that Chicago pumping, like Coco Taylor kind of sound. Anyway, it was, it was ridiculous. And uh, I was very, very impressed with the music but I still wasn't moved, right? So at the end of the night, they, he finished and he walked off stage and they and they came back and they were he, they were screaming, you know, like in Maine, like, I play one more there, Bob. <laughs> right, and, and he comes out and he does his song. I, I've heard Booker, if you guys don't know who James Booker is, man, you should check it out, right? The only person I've ever heard touch this song is even close to Cotton. Booker, I'm, man, I'm getting, it's ridiculous. But it was this song called Black Knight. And he got up there and he, he did that song and then the band broke it down, slap. And he sang without the microphone, just to the audience, right? And you could hear the proverbial pin drop, all these drunken fishermen from Maine just shut up. And in that moment, it was clear to me at 13 years old, that everything bad that had happened to Cotton and everything good that had happened to him it had to happen so that he could communicate that feeling. And the funny thing was is that everything that had happened to the audience bad and good had to happen so that we could receive that. And it was a cyclical thing and that is music. And ever since that day, I made a decision to ruin my life and I'm just really, really happy to do it with such beautiful people like Jack Joshua. Yeah. Uh Night. Night. 
So my brother, whose name is Noel Ritchie, right? He used to like, no, this is a Maine accent. They, they stole it from us. We were there, like, historically. <laughs> first. <laughs> first ever. Anyway, my brother stole, uh, my brother would park anywhere he wanted to on the streets of Portland, right? And they, like, plow on certain days, so you got to move over to certain side. Anyway, you got all these parking tickets. They piled up, and they put a boot on the car. So anyway, we walk out, we took a couple bong rips and boom, sitting on the car, right? And my brother just like, no, without even thinking like this, lets a little air out of the tie and kicks the fucking boot. Anyway, we reached over and we grabbed it and we wrapped it up in a towel and we put it in the back of his Jeep and drove down and we threw it right into the ocean, Italian style. So anyway, the chief of police, who's always hated my family, calls my brother into the fucking car, interrogated. He's like fucking 16 years old. And the guy's like, I know you took the boot. There's only three boots in the entire city of Portland. They're like worth $10,000 each. Where'd you do what you do with it? And my brother's just like, hey, Mike, aren't those things supposed to be like impossible to get off? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> At the bottom of the ocean right now. Castle Bay, along with the boat. Yeah. No apology necessary. No, but we have a pizza guy there. We're really happy with him. First gig. We've got the slow moving Glovis boat going underneath the bridge. Gorgeous, but I do not know what that body of water is. It's beautiful and chilly. And we're just about to take a break from the first first set. It is a weird thing, driving for two nights and finding yourself in this ridiculously serene looking surroundings. I'm still trying to get the pulse of every place, every state has a little bit of a different rhythm. My mom used to tell me that every city was friendly to a different type of mental illness. And she said, New York City, that's schizophrenic, schizophrenic friendly. You can walk around talking to yourself. No one's gonna put you away for that. Boston, I found was kind of more shut-in friendly. In Boston, you can lock yourself in your house and never come out and no one will check to see what became of you, whereas in the South, it seems like, uh, you know, people will make up stories about you. If you don't come out of your house for years, you're going to have some crazy story about what you're up to in there. 